so I, I'm doing fine, that kind of thing. So, but if my voice is a little gruff, it's just because of that. But uh, happy to have you here, and let us begin tonight with prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you this evening in the name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus. And we again thank you for giving us uh, the news of your birth. We also thank you for the news of you dying for us on the cross. We thank you for the news of that empty tomb. We also uh, give thanks to you that you have promised that you will be with us always. And you are here with us tonight as you have promised. Where two or three are gathered in your name, there you are with them. We ask that you send your Holy Spirit within our hearts tonight as we study your word. In your name we pray this. Amen. Amen. We are on lesson three. So... But um, just kind of going through the <clears throat> first couple of lessons, you know, just kind of keep you up to speed and everything. Remember the first lesson we were talking about, how do we know that there is a God? You know, if we didn't have the Bible, how would we know that there is a God? We know that there is a God. Everyone has this knowledge through nature and also our conscience. Okay, so you just take a good look around this world and you're going to see maybe not God running around in the field or in the skies, but you'll see his fingerprints all around you. If you slow down, take a good look. Everyone has this knowledge. And another way that the Lord, uh, uh, you know, uh, everyone knows that there is a God because that conscience that God has placed within all of us. And if you've ever heard that little voice, when you've done something, you're going, I should have done that. Well, where does that voice come from? You know, God has written that law on our hearts. But the only problem with the natural knowledge of God, it tells us that there must be a God out there but it doesn't tell us who the true God is and how we are saved. And that's why we get into God's word. This is how he reveals himself to us. It's through his word and his word alone that he reveals himself to us. And uh, the Bible doesn't tell us everything about God. It's really the plan of salvation, you know, how God saved us. And then um, we got into how our, our roots, where did we come from? God created the heavens and the earth, and we were his special crowns of creation, and all was well. My last uh, lesson that we had, all was perfect, the Garden of Eden, Genesis chapter 2, you know, everything was going great, and then uh, one of my members uh, from out east said, then Genesis chapter 3 happens, you know, would have been nice if uh, the Bible was only two chapters long. You know, and they lived happily ever after. But then Genesis chapter 3 comes and everything is broken. Because sin enters the world. And uh, it's really important to know that because a lot of times people ask you, well, God is so good, why are things so bad? Well, we live in a broken world. We live in broken lives. But uh, Jesus is here to restore that as well. So if you uh, just look into... Uh, that introduction, hope shattered and hope restored, and it says here in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4, For God did not spare angels when they sinned, but sent them to hell, putting them into gloomy dungeons to be held for judgment. And did you find where we're at, Pam? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let's see. I, found, I found where we had ended last time. This is just for at home, work at home. There you go. Thank you. There we go. Thank you, sir. Yep, not a problem. Okay, got it. And for all those who are following along virtually as well, we are on page 13 in the manual that was sent out to you. So we're on the top page. In 2 Peter 2, 4, it says this, For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but sent them to hell, putting them into gloomy dungeons to be held for judgment. Okay, and then it also says this, Revelation 12, verse 9, The great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil, or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. Okay, the reason we're beginning right there is because part of God's perfect creation was he created all the angels as well. All things visible and invisible in the six day creation. And he also gave all the angels free will as well. You know, they could listen to God or they didn't need to listen to God. 
And uh, uh, some of them decided not to listen to God. They rebelled against God. And what, does ha what happens? God sends Satan or Lucifer and the angels that followed him into hell. Okay. So, but now uh, a lot of you are probably saying, well, could that ever happen again? Those who remain with God, our Lord, they no longer can sin. So the only time I'll probably ever use uh, Latin terms up here is probably right now. Say, uh, they are created a pulse of Tara. And that means able to sin. Okay? And now when uh, uh, some of them fell and he uh, sent them to hell, they are now known Pulsa Patara. Well, they were able to sin. Those that remain are not able to sin anymore. And uh, again, it's just like with us. You know, we've fallen into sin. Okay? And, uh, but this is our current condition right now. Known. Pulsa. Known. Patara. That means not able not to sin. Even though we don't want to sin, we keep on sinning. But when we're in heaven one day, we'll be no impulse of the car, not able to sin. Okay? So that's, that's how, you know, sin entered this world. Okay? So uh, when he uh, used his free will, you know, to destroy, or, you know, to rebel against God, God sent them to hell. And uh, if uh, you're like me, do you, is it always fun being in trouble by yourself? Not so much. Right? Uh, if you're going into the dean's office, do you rather be the only one sitting on that leather couch? Or would you like a whole bunch of people in that room sitting on the leather couch before Dean? But again, this is the only way that Satan could lash out at God. Like, I can't change anything. I know my fate. But now I'm here to destroy, you know, your perfect creation. Okay? And he's still leading the whole world astray. Okay? And uh, I'm going to just get into uh, Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 14. And as I read this, I'm going to comment on this as well. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say, You must not eat from any tree in the garden? That's how Satan comes to us yet today, right? All he wants us to do is doubt. Right? He, he always comes to us and he says, Richard, did God really say your sins are all forgiven? You know, he's very good at that. Joanne, are you certain? That God paid for your sins? Question mark. You know, right? Okay. What did Jesus say on the cross? He said, it is finished. It is finished. It is finished. And what does Satan come to us and say? He, he turns exclamation into a question mark. Is it finished? How can he be certain? Okay. That's how he still works today. He just needs us to doubt. Okay. And verse 2, the woman said to the serpent, we may, eat, um, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say, you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden. You must not touch it or you will die. Again, uh, why, why was that uh, tree the knowledge of good and evil smack dab right in the middle of God's perfect creation? God wasn't tempting Adam and Eve. They had free will. Okay? Every time they passed by that tree and didn't eat of it, who was worshipped? Our gracious God. Okay? Remember what I said uh, last time? You know, uh, God doesn't want to have uh, artificial love toward, show towards him. He wants authentic. And how I said, like, I could get my kids to say, Dad, you are the best dad in the world if I just looked at him and said, you better tell me right now, otherwise you're going to be in your room for the rest of your life. Am I the best dad? Yes, you're the best dad. Okay, that's artificial. Okay, but I'm just raking the leaves, and, and uh, my youngest also comes by picking up pine cones, and he just says, all the blue, Dad, you're the best dad in the world. Now, that's authentic, right? Okay, so that's why he put that tree in the, in the middle of the garden. 
But then uh, Satan, he's, he's also a liar as well. You will not surely die, the serpent said to the woman. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. And the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. So just going through that section again, you know, it's the same way how sin always enters our lives, though, too. Right? It usually happens this way. Sin usually enters through your eye or your ears. Now where does it go? Does it stay there in your eye? Does it stay there in your ear? No, it goes to your, your brain. You start thinking about it. And it's conceived in your heart. And it comes out in actions. You know, this, uh, for example, uh, King David. What do you all know about King David? You know, he's the one that struck down Goliath. And what else? What do you know about King David? Usually, this is what I always think of when I think of King David. Adultery, yes, right? Murder. Yeah, murder. Okay. How he tried to cover up sin, but again, he had everything. And so there's Bathsheba, you know, the, the wife of Uriah. He's sitting there on the top of his palace, and he looks down, and she's bathing. So she, he sees her, okay? Sin comes in the eye. He thinks about her, and that sin's conceived in his heart. And then it comes out in actual actions, Okay? And also, that it's like the same thing probably in our lives, though, too. Okay? And uh, then he goes on to say this uh, in verse 6 again. Uh, when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. So a lot of people go, well, who, who sinned first? Remember the two different roles? Everyone goes, oh, you know, who's there with Eve, though? Adam, right? And it's, hey, wait a minute. Remember? What the, no, no. No, you go ahead first. Who knows? They both sinned, okay? They both ate it. And that, at that moment, the eyes of both of them were open. And they realized they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. And then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God, as he is walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord, from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord called out to the, out to the man, "Where are you?" So again, this in that verse eight. Verse eight. I think, uh, and you probably heard me say this in a sermon or two. I think it's one of the saddest verses in all of Scripture, because what happens? You know, the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he is walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. You know, they, they, they once had a great relationship with it, and then when they, they know they're guilty of sin, they hide from him. You can imagine I'm knocking onto uh, your, your kid's house one day or home, and they just hide on you, don't answer the doorbell, saying, I don't want to have anything to do with you. I, I know I've done wrong. Okay, then the Lord calls out to him, where are you? You know, why does he do that? Did he really not know where they were? He knows everything, right? Give them an opportunity to confess, right? Say, oh, Lord, they're right here. We've done this. But that doesn't happen, does it? He answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, you know, he didn't say yes. The man said, The woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree, and I ate it. So again, who does he blame? Who does he blame? The only other person to blame. <laughs> Well, he's not just blaming Eve, though. The woman you put here with me, right, too? But now, okay, how do you think Eve's feeling right at this point? 
If I go back home and call Lori, hey, woman, come here. I don't think she'd really care for that, right? Can't even call her by her name. The woman you put here with me. You know? So everything. Their relationship with God is severed. Uh, their relationship between both of them. There's a lot of stress there already now. Right? So you can see the results of sin already. Okay, taking place. Then verse 13 on the next page. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me and I ate. So, you know, no one takes the blame. They're always passing the buck. You know, um, I, th I think we do that all the time, too, a lot of times. So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all the livestock and all the wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. Now, just going through some of these questions, we've answered some of these, but just to kind of go through these again. Now remember God had told Adam and Eve not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. As the devil comes, how does he first approach Adam and Eve? He begins with a lie. Any tree to make God sound bad. And then he wants them to doubt, did God really say it? Two, the devil then steps up to attack. How so? Genesis 3, 4, it says he denies God's clear word. The devil quotes God, you will surely die, then he adds, not on the end. So, does uh, Satan know the Bible? He knows it very well. Okay? Remember uh, Jesus' temptation in the desert? How uh, he kind of switched the, the words around just a little bit. You know, so again, um, and he still does that with us today. Three, unfortunately, what uh, did uh, Adam and Eve both do? Deliberately ate. They broke the perfect relationship and trust. And then four, after Adam and Eve fell into sin, they displayed many disturbing attitudes and actions which showed how this had affected every part of their lives. How had it affected each of the following areas? About their relationship with God, they are terrified of God now. They hide from and resent Him. B, their relationship to each other, blame each other, have to be clothed. There is stress, a lot of stress now in that marriage. That perfect union. Why did they, why does it say they deliberately ate? They deliberately, you know, it wasn't like Satan taking that apple or forbidden fruit and saying, okay, come here, and just shoved it in there. You know, they they did it all themselves. Were they scared of Satan? No. Well, I, you know, when he came, I'm not really sure, but I'm going, they could trust in the Lord with all their heart. But, uh, but they deliberately, they had the choice. No one was forcing it. They had the choice. Yeah, okay. Yep. You know? So they deliberately ate. You know, we, we made the decision to sin. I know I'm not supposed to do this, but I, I did it anyways. And then see their self image. It's filled with guilt, shame, fear, pain, shirking responsibility, passing the buck. Okay? I'll just pause here. Do you guys have any questions on this section? Okay, so that's how he led Adam and Eve astray. And we still battle with the same devil, you know, the same Satan. And he's doing everything he can to lead us astray as well. And that's why it's so important uh, to know uh, where we stand because of Christ. You know, so again, if he ever uh, holds you down uh, with guilt because of certain things you've done in your life, if he reminds you of certain things in your past, take him all the way back to the past, to where Jesus Christ died on the cross. You say, why did Christ die on the cross? Yeah, that's for my sin, the sins of the whole world. You know, so again, uh, he always wants to change our identity. Or he always likes to add an extra inning uh, to uh, a battle that we already won. If you want game number seven uh, of uh, a World Series, now the opposing team goes, hey, how about we just play one more game? You know, would you do it? Probably no. I'm going, no, we won. You know, so... Don't get it, because Satan always wants us to add another quarter, another fifth quarter. It's like, oh, well, he's done all this, you've won, but just play one more quarter. No, I'm victorious in Christ. So, but he's, um, he's uh, leading a lot of people away. But then Genesis chapter 3, verses 16 and 19. Here's some more consequences to sin. 
To the woman he said, I will greatly increase your pains in childbearing. With pain you'll give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. And I think everyone knows about the, the, the pain in childbearing. You know, but another one I think we kind of overlook though is your desire will be for your husband and he'll rule over you. You know, uh, Adam in the perfect uh, world was the leader, but she didn't resent that at all. It's a wonderful thing. You know, it's just that we have two different roles, you know, and, and they're both very important. One to lead, the other to help. And, but now there's resentment. Okay? I don't like that at all. You know, so we see that in our day and age. Um, uh, to Adam, he said, because you have listened to your wife and ate from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you'll eat of it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you'll eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow, you'll eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken. For dust you are, and to dust you will return. So again, it's just uh, more or less uh, trying to make ends meet. I don't think we're all gardeners or anything like that, but it's just like you finally think you might be getting a little ahead, and then this happens. You know, it's just like it's just always turmoil. You know, those are the thorns and thistles, just frustrating a lot of times. But then uh, also the biggest consequence of sin is you will die. Okay. Let's uh, read Genesis 3, 16 through 19, which we did. What effects did sin have upon Adam and Eve? Pain and childbirth, marriage bond always tainted by sin, work now difficult and frustrating. And what was the worst effect of sin? Death. Let's consider the following passages, but before that, any comments or questions? Is there any strife or turmoil in your marriage? You know? Any strife or turmoil in your marriage ever? You know? Right? You know, it's, uh, it's uh, like a loaded question and everything. Uh, I always uh, tell people, uh, if I come over to your house, I'll never ask the question, hey, do your mom and dad fight, you know, to the little ones? I, I won't ever do that. But I'm going, but see, the thing is, uh, you know, I always tell people, like, uh, you know, like the marriage ceremony and everything, there is going to be strife. There is going to be words exchanged. Unfortunately, that's what happens. But uh, again, have Christ in your marriage. You know, that you'll have that unbreakable marriage. But again, um, uh, when uh, you are in an argument or uh, whatever you want to call it, uh, and if you know that you're wrong, you know, uh, always get the last word in. So if uh, Lori uh, wrongs me, okay, and she comes to me, and uh, she says, I'm sorry, Mark, I said, well, you better be sorry, you know. No, never. Get the last word in, and that's, you're forgiven. And uh, when I go to her, probably like three or four times a day, and say, hey, honey, I'm sorry. You know, but they hear that, you're forgiven, you know. Forgiveness heals the marriage. You know, the, the way out if there is some, you know, uh, fighting back and forth or whatever, you know, sarcasm, whatever you want to say, the way out is, you know, uh, express your sin to each other, but also know that you are, you know, uh, fully forgiven in Christ. And that's how you start your whole day. Once again, it's a whole new day. Okay? Uh, Genesis chapter 5, verse 3 says, When Adam had lived 130 years, he had a son in his own likeness, in his own image. So when Seth is born, he isn't born in the image of God. Instead, whose image does he bear? Adam's. So sinful Adam, so no longer in the image of God. Uh, are children simple? Are babies simple? Yes, they are. You know, because, like, uh, do I have the perfect children? Did I have the perfect babies? No. Because I'm simple. My wife is simple. We can't produce perfect children. They are already tainted. And I, I, it doesn't really take too long to see that, yes, they are sinful. You know, uh, just to see the little temper tantrums already really early on and everything, too. You know, so again, my, my children are not born in the image of God. They're born in the image of sinful mom and sinful dad. Okay. And then um, 
Psalm 51, verse 5, it says, Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. In fact, you know, not only are we sinful at birth, but from what moment? From conception. Okay? Any comments or questions? Okay. Then Mark 7, uh, uh, Mark 7, chapter, Mark chapter 7, verses 21 through 23, it says, For from within, out of men's hearts, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. All these evils come from inside and make a man's heart or make a man unclean. So our sinful condition doesn't remain hidden, but shows itself. And how? Sinful thoughts, words, and deeds. You know, um, a lot of times uh, we can only see a person's actions, right? But uh, if all your thoughts were written on your forehead, would any of you be looking at me right now? Probably I'll be like this, right? You know, uh, again, thoughts are sinful. You know, they don't always come out in actions, but thoughts are evil though too. You know, uh, it's amazing how fast your your uh, mind, you know, can go into the gutter. You know, maybe it's not just lust or anything like that, but it's maybe hatred. You know, how it can just turn like that? You know, or you can get out of church and all of a sudden, and within five minutes, it's like here I am again. You know. Um, but again, that's 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 part of us, you know. Our our body is really uh, an enemy of ours. Um, it's a sin, our sinful flesh. Um, and uh, what what is the universal uh, sign for love? I'll help you. It usually happens on Valentine's Day. A heart. A heart. Do you think that's a really nice sign for what love is? A heart. According to this passage. You know, from within, out of men's hearts come evil thoughts. You know, pro probably not. What is a better, maybe, symbol of what true love is? I, I think it would be the cross, right? You know, uh, what God did for us. How about this? Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 4. For every living soul belongs to me, the Father as well as the Son. Both alike belong to me. The soul who sins is the one who will die. The fair punishment for sin is death. So food for thought... Um, what do these passages tell us about who we are? And how does this section help us understand the world around us? You know, uh, we are God's creation, but we're defeated by sin, responsible to God. The world is decaying, affected by sin, and rebelling against God. Do you see that in the world today? You can see that, right? That's all around us. You know, uh, why do people do these things? Uh, they don't know their Savior, you know, but again, uh, we are all flawed, you know, uh, and we don't usually contain our thoughts, they come out in actions a lot of times too, and uh, that's why I try to stay away from watching the news all the time, it's pretty depressing uh, at all times. Um, but then section two, uh, what did God determine to do for sinful mankind? He didn't throw us away, you know, he didn't say I was going to start over. But he promises to save us. First, um, Genesis 3.15, this is the first promise of a Savior that is going to come and reverse the curse. And it says this, And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. So in sin, Adam and Eve had turned their relationship to God into one of hostility. At the same time, they made, uh, made friends with the devil, here, what does God promise to do? He promises he'll return the hostile relationship to where it belongs, between us, humans, and the devil. You know, we might have expected God to simply start over, but to do so would have meant that God would have had to send Adam and Eve to hell. But instead of promising to send a Savior, what is God teaching us about himself? He really does want all people to be saved. And then 1 John 3, 8, it says, the, the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. You know, so again, um, I, I always uh, thought about um, 
for Adam and Eve, Eve is probably pretty good, pretty easy to teach, let's say, Sunday school. Because there would probably be three lessons to this. God created a perfect world for us. We fell into sin. Everything's destroyed. But God said, a serpent crusher is coming. The Savior is coming. You know, and that's, you know, they, they put their hope in that. You know, so again, uh, more or less three lessons as opposed to all the New Testament lessons and everything else too. But again, uh, God gave, up, gave them the hope that the, a Savior was coming. But I'm going to just read, and this is going to be the lengthiest section I ever read from uh, the Bible for starting point, and it's probably one of the most boring parts, but it's really kind of important. It might not seem important right at first, but in the end, you'll understand why the importance is. Okay? And uh, this is uh, uh, one of their religious service, uh, services uh, back in the, the Jewish times. And the Day of Atonement. And uh, the Lord spoke, and there's no yawning during this section. Just, and I'll be watching. So, uh, The Lord spoke uh, to Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron, who died when they approached the Lord. The Lord said to Moses, Tell your brother Aaron not to come whenever he chooses into the most holy place behind the curtain, behind the curtain in the front of the atonement cover on the ark, or else he will die, because I appear in the cloud over the atonement cover. You know, so this may be to... Uh, Explain this, the whole setup of like the temple. Just like this. I gotta just go H. Holy of Holies. And there's a thick curtain right here, okay? And then we have the holy place. And then we had the whole, for the assembly, all the Israelites could come there. All the priests could be there. This is where the ark was. And you could only go there if you were invited. And what separated, because God's presence was there, what separated the holy place from the holy of holies was a thick, thick curtain. If you went in there and the holy of holies unannounced, you would die. Okay? And also, again, uh, this is how... Uh, you know, the Lord is showing how to get into the Holy of Holies. This is what the priest had to do, okay? And then verse 3, this is how Aaron is to enter the sanctuary area. With young bull for a sin offering, a ram for a burnt offering, he is to put on a sacred linen tunic with linen undergarments uh, next to his body. He is to tie the linen sash around him and put on the linen turban. These are the sacrament, uh, sacred uh, garments. So he must bathe himself with water before he puts them on. From the Israelite community, he is to take two male goats for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. Aaron is to offer the bull for his own sin offering to make atonement for himself and his household. Then he is to take the two goats and present them before the Lord at the entrance to the tent of meeting. He is to cast lots for the two goats, one lot for the Lord and the other for the scapegoat. Aaron shall bring the goat who is Lot falls to the Lord and sacrifice it for a sin offering. And you thought our services were long, right? But the goat chosen by Lot as a scapegoat shall be presented live before the Lord to be used for making atonement by sending it into the desert as a scapegoat. Aaron shall bring the bull for his own sin offering to make atonement for himself and his household. And he is to slaughter the bull for his own sin offering. He is to take a censure full of burning coals from the altar before the Lord and two handfuls of finely ground fragrant incense and take them behind the curtain. He is to put the incense on the fire before the Lord and the smoke of the incense will conceal the atonement cover above it, uh, above the testimony so that he will not die. He is to take some of the bull's blood and with his finger sprinkle it on from the atonement cover, and he shall sprinkle some of it with his finger seven times before the atonement cover. He shall then slaughter the goat for the sin offering for the people and take its blood behind the curtain and do with it as he did with the bull's, bull's, bull's blood. He shall sprinkle it on the atonement cover and in front of it. In this way he'll make atonement for the most holy place because of the uncleanness and rebellion of the Israelites. 
whatever their sins have been. He is to do the same for the tent of meeting, which is among them in the midst of their uncleanness. No one is to be in the tent of meeting from the time Aaron goes in to make atonement in the most holy place until he comes out, having made atonement for himself, his household, and the whole community of Israel. So, you know, this, uh, this is maybe a comment on something. Um, remember during the Passover, a lot of times, um, you know, I have to sacrifice something. You know, uh, the best uh, sacrifice that you could uh, bring was uh, a lamb without blemish or defect. But, uh, but again, uh, the slaughtering of all those animals, you know, uh, it was just to show everyone the seriousness of sin. You know, the shedding of blood. And uh, again, you know, God used all the senses to show how serious our sin was. Have uh, any of you ever watched an animal die? Yeah, it's, it's not a pleasant thing, you know. Hopefully it's a clean shot or whatever, but it's not a, a pretty thing or anything like that. You want to put it out of its mer uh, misery, but again, but to see that, you know, did you ever hear an animal die sometimes? They're in agony or whatever. It's not a pleasant sound either. Um, I, I can remember this uh, when we were heading back to Vermont that one time. Uh, we were looking for uh, uh, hotels to stay at, and and uh, we still had our triptychs way back then, you know, big old book and everything. And going, okay, we're, we're going here. I guess uh, let's go to this hotel. So there's a whole bunch of hotels. I'm going, well, this one's so much cheaper. How about we? You know, uh, you know, go over there and see if they have uh, some rooms there. And I, I didn't realize I was so cheap, you know, but uh, went there. It's a beautiful hotel. You know, and go, wow, you know, we, we hit the gold mine here and everything. And uh, but because all the other uh, hotels are like three miles uh, down the other side of the road, on the other side of the highway. But the next morning came, and a stench came over the entire land there. Because uh, this hotel is so close to a slaughterhouse. Have you ever smelt a time close to a slaughterhouse? You know, all the, the dead animals. It's a, you know, so again, you smell that as well. So you see, you smell, you hear, you know. Uh, you know, so again, it's just showing the seriousness of sin. So again, it wasn't a pleasant, okay, well, this is fine. We, we, we just did this, but, you know, thinking of all the animals. Uh, but again, showing us the seriousness of sin. Then verse 18, then he shall come out. To the altar that is before the Lord and make atonement for it. You shall take some of the bull's blood and some of the goat's blood and put it on all the horns of the altar. The horns are the corners. Okay, they are horns, actually horns with the corners of the altar. You shall sprinkle some of the blood on it with his finger seven times to cleanse it and to consecrate it from the uncleanness of the Israelites. When Aaron had finished making atonement for the most holy place, the tent of meeting and the altar, he shall bring forth the live goat to lay both hands on the head of the live goat and confess over it all the wickedness and rebellion of the Israelites, all their sins, and put them on the goat's head. He shall send that goat away in the desert to the care of a man appointed for the task. The goat will carry on itself all the sins to a solitary place, and the man shall release it in the desert. Then Aaron is to go into the tent of meeting and take off the linen garments he put on before he entered the most holy place, and he is to leave them there. He shall bathe himself with water in a, holy, in a holy place and put on his regular garments. Then he shall come out and sacrifice the burnt offering for himself and the burnt offering for the people to make atonement for himself and for the people. He shall also burn the fat and the sin offering on the altar. The man who releases the goat as a scapegoat must wash his clothes and bathe himself with water. Afterward, he may come into the camp. The bull and the goat for the sin offerings, whose blood was uh, brought into the most holy place to make atonement, must be taken outside the camp. Their hides, flesh, and offal are to be burned up. The man who burns them must wash his clothes and bathe himself with water after he may come into the camp. This Quite is, a ritual, isn't it? What's that? Quite a ritual. Isn't yeah. It? Yeah. It's a messy job, you know. Mm -hmm. But I'm going uh, all the things, you know, to make atonement, you know, go through all this to you know, bring God and his people together. So a lot of things had to go. Okay, but it just symbolized that they were together. Okay, and this is the Old Testament. 
Now, verse 29, this is to be the lasting ordinance for you. On the tenth day of the seventh month, you must deny yourselves and not do any work, whether native-born or an alien living among you, because on this day of atonement will be made for, will be made for you to cleanse you, and before the Lord you will be clean from all your sins. This is Sabbath of rest, and you must deny yourselves. Uh, uh, it is a lasting ordinance. The priest who is anointed and ordained to succeed his father as high priest is to make atonement. He is to put on the sacred linen garments and make atonement for the most holy place, for the tent of meeting and the altar, and for the priests and all the people of the community. This is to be a lasting ordinance for you. Atonement is to be made once a year for all the sins of the Israelites. And it was done as the Lord commanded Moses. So just kind of going through this and a little bit you'll understand why I'm taking you through this. Okay, there is a point. You know, so but just that first question in Leviticus chapter 16, verse 2, we learned that Aaron, the high priest, wasn't to go into the most holy place any time he wanted. If he dared to come in, in on his own whim, what did God say would happen? No, he, he would die. And what lesson was God teaching through that? Sinful man cannot stand in the presence of a holy God. Okay? Sin and holiness does not mix. Okay? Three, after sacrificing a bull for his own sins, Aaron was sent to sacrifice the first of the goats. What was there to do with the blood? Sprinkle it around the atonement cover, the cover over the ark containing the Ten Commandments. And four, what lessons about forgiveness was God teaching through that? A sacrifice for sins was necessary. Jesus would have to die. But now God looks at us through what Jesus has done. Also taught substitution. And then again in Le Leviticus chapter 16, verses 20 through 22, after Aaron confessed the sins of the people on the goat's head, what was uh, to happen with that goat? It was to be led out into the desert, the scapegoat. Okay? Didn't do anything, but all the sins were on. So Jesus is our scapegoat. All the sins were placed upon him. And then what lessons does God teach us about forgiveness through this? When God forgives, he thoroughly forgives. Our sins are gone, totally out of God's sight. Again, substitution is taught. So again, God wanted to impress this on his people's minds. Uh, this ritual would have, have uh, touched four of the five senses, perhaps all five. And also, it's the seriousness of sin. You know, it's, uh, but uh, later on we're going to see the seriousness of our Savior in saving us. But then Hebrews chapter 10 Verses 3 through 4. But those sacrifices are an annual reminder of sins. Because it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. So again, uh, we can't be saved through the shedding of blood of animals. So all those Old Testament sacrifices were unable to actually take away sins. Instead, what was their purpose? To remind the people of their sin and their need for forgiveness. You know, the Old Testament is always pointing forward. You know, uh, our sins are serious. The Old Testament is saying, but the Messiah, the Christ, is coming. Uh, what is uh, Jesus called when uh, he's baptized? What does uh, uh, John the Baptist call him? Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Why do you think he calls him the Lamb? What's another way of saying the Lamb? The sacrifice of God has come to take away the sins of the world. So Jesus is our sacrifice. He sacrificed himself for the sins of the whole world. Then 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18, For Christ died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. So there is forgiveness. Where is it to be found? In Jesus. Okay, um, I love that section, though. So for Christ uh, died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. You know, um, what did uh, Martin Luther say? Lord Jesus, I am your righteousness. Lord Jesus, uh, it's, how does it go? Uh, Lord Jesus, you are my righteousness, I am your sin. You became what you were not to make me what I was not. Or, uh, or as it says in Philippians, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he is rich, yet for our sakes he became poor, so that we, through his poverty, might become rich. Substitution. Right? He, he takes our place. Blood had to be shed. It wasn't just the blood of a lamb, but it was the blood of the lamb of God who had come, 
you know, to take away the sins of the world. But if you get into Luke chapter 23, verses 44 through 46, and this is why we went through Leviticus now. And so this is where we find Jesus on the cross. Okay? It was now about the sixth hour. And uh, how they start uh, their day, like we always start ours at midnight, and it's a new day, 12.01, okay? They always began their day at 6 in the morning, okay? So the sixth hour is at, at noon, okay? So about the sixth hour, uh, and darkness came over the whole land until the ninth hour from noon to 3, for the sun stopped shining. This is when Jesus died, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he had said this, he breathed his last. So when Jesus died, what happened to that temple curtain which had separated humans from God? It was torn in two. Okay? Into this, uh, so like this, remember? This curtain between the Holy of Holies, the holy place, the assembly, no one could go through there because that was what separated holiness, our holy God, from us, sinful creatures. Okay, but when Jesus Christ died on the cross, what happened? He removed. There's no longer any separation between God and us. He's made atonement for us. You know, uh, the way I always remember atonement is, um, you know, God is here, we are here, and our sins, you know, separate us from God. But when Jesus Christ died on the cross, that sin was removed, and now we're at one with God. We have been atoned for, okay? So there's nothing separating us between us and our God. Our sin has been paid in full. Then Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 and 22, it says, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith. So what did that tearing of the curtain signify? We now can enter the most holy place. God invites us to come into his presence with confidence and assurance. Relationship and hope restored. In Acts 16, 31, it says, They replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved, you and your household. So how does God give me the benefits of Jesus' work? By working faith into my heart. And how does he do that? That'll be next lesson. I know that this is definitely a shorter lesson. Next week it's going to be a little bit longer. But uh, we're going to be getting into the means of grace. You know, uh, how does God create and sustain faith within our, within our hearts? But just a summary here. Sin shattered mankind's relationship with God and uh, brought difficulty into every aspect of life. Every person is born a sinner, deserving God's wrath and deserving to go to hell. Because God wants us all to be saved, God promised to send the Savior to win forgiveness for humans. Because of Jesus' work, God has completely forgiven me and all people. I can now come into uh, God's presence with confidence because my sins have been totally and completely removed. God gives me the benefits of what Jesus did by working faith in my heart. And uh, I'm going to just uh, close here. I'm going to just... Uh, uh, turn our, our uh, Facebook Live off because I just wanted to go on a couple other things. I, I know I didn't give you really any chance to ask any questions, but um, and this can be on any other topic because I want to make sure you you might ask some certain questions and I'll say yes, no, we're going to be going through that. That's coming up in like three lessons. Or there might be a, a question that you might have uh, on your mind that you, you have no problem sharing with this room, but you don't know if you want to have it recorded uh, for, for everyone to hear and everything else too. And uh, if you have any questions uh, watching this film tonight, make sure you write those down or, or let me know, and I'll let you know if we're going to be going through that. If not, I'll uh, uh, personally contact you. God willing to answer that question and everything. So, so with that, I'm going to just close with prayer, then I'm going to just move into some other questions. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you this evening in the name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus. And me again, thank you for uh, bringing us around your word tonight. And uh, we see how uh, serious our sin is, but uh, we also see how serious you were in saving us. We, we thank you uh, for uh, purifying us from all of our sin. 
And may we always know that uh, even though our, our thoughts and our attitudes and our actions are sinful, we, we, we confess them to you and know that we are clean because of your Son, our Savior, Jesus. We are clean because of Christ. May we always remember to do this. In your name we pray this.